our our May membership meeting. Hope everybody is enjoying the great weather. We finally have some warm weather. Uh, Emma will be joining us later, but we need to get started a little bit early, and so she is coming from work, but we'll give her president's report. Uh, but I wanted to bring all the order, and uh, I think the first order of business is to, uh, is there any new, or uh, I think everybody got an agenda, is there anything that's not on the agenda, any new business items that we need to be going for? If not, uh, motion to accept the minutes. Thank you. Under the agenda. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, welcome again. And I first want to thank our incredible leadership on the Industry Relations Committee, uh, co chairs Bob Gel <laughs> Gelber. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know why I have five yells on something. And that Bob, uh, co chairs, and also Harvey, who's the name I can Well, thank you guys for putting this all together. And also a huge thank you to our speaker today, uh, Judith Birdie, and also Danielle Sher, who is from the New York Public Library. Thank you for your guest. Uh, thank you so much. And I point to, we do need to have a sort of strict time where we do need to be out of here at 7 30. So that's one of the reasons that we're starting a little early. So without further ado, I want to get the ball rolling and invite Bob up to Bob Gelbert. Okay, so thank you all for coming to Rosewood Island. This is the first time, in my knowledge, we've ever had a membership meeting on the islands here, and I've been a fan of it for years. years. Judy would know more because she was here when they created the island. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank the Roosevelt Island Public Library and Daniel Scher for graciously allowing us to be here when things didn't work out. With my original plan last July when I first came here. I'm waiting for a place to be here. But uh, Judy saved the day for us, and the staff of the library was gracious. So, Danielle, just say hi. Hello. And just me. Um, yes, and at any point you need to use the restroom, just go up to the circulation desk and ask for a key. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do Emma's report? No, Emma will present the president's report, but why don't you introduce our speaker? Oh, okay. I think we'll just go from there. Oh, sorry. Yes. I need my treasurer's report. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Okay. Do you want to? Yeah. Yes, sure. Or Billy Pine. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I think everyone here knows me. I'm Jared Wilcox. I'm the treasurer of the association. So I just wanted to give uh, two quick kind of updates uh, related to treasury stuff. Uh, first is that if you have not yet signed up for the optional insurance policy uh, and you need coverage starting June 1st, uh, you must have sent, you must send in a payment by at the absolute latest May 25th. If you do not have your payment in hand by May 25th, you'll have to wait for the next sign up cycle. Uh, so if you already have insurance, this is a moot point, but just letting people know uh, either at home or here at the insurance, uh, the, the link is on the website. You can email me if any questions. Uh, also, wanted to give as we're getting back into the season of doing more in person events and fan tours, uh, just a kind of reminder about the policy for those events and the fees. So, no showing, uh, as has been the policy for many years, uh, no showing a Gannett <coughs> fan tour uh, incurs a $25 no show fee, uh, and that policy does also state that if you cancel 48 hours or lower before the tour, that basically qualifies as a no-show. Um, we still have one or two no-shows for every fan tour, so we just want to make sure people are aware of this policy. And like I always say when I give this particular spiel, this is not a policy that's meant to be punitive. Our ideal income from the no-show is zero dollars and zero cents. Uh, this is just to you know maintain a level of professionalism. 
about this program. As, as I'm sure those of you who have been on fan tours know, most fan tours either sell out or come very close to selling out. So it's just to make sure that we respect all the people who might need to get into those slots. Yes. When, when, when one checks to see about fan tours and what our registrations are, it says if you need to cancel, check with the administrator. That's rather vague. That's a, unfortunately a boiler point thing that Wild Apricot uh, puts in, but I'll make sure I'll send an email out in the next few days with, again, the explicit instructions for how to cancel your own registration. You can either do that through the Wild Apricot app or on a desktop. Um, doing it on a desktop is slightly easier than trying to come over with the app, frankly, um, But yeah, if it's 48 hours or more before the tour, you do have to cancel uh, yourself. You do not accept cancellation requests by email to the committee or the guy or anyone else. Like you would expect your own customers to kind of uh, take care of their own stuff, be on time, courteous, and uh, that kind of stuff. We, we always say like we are all professionals here. We expect the same from ourselves and our colleagues here as we would expect from our own uh, clients. Yes. Oh. This is just a recommendation. Uh, when you put up a thing for the fan tours, like for instance, today I had two huge bags I didn't expect. Maybe if you said, hey, this fan tour has a place where you can put luggage items or bags or come by, or because if people are caught with a large bag, they don't know what to do. Or, we usually do put in the, in the information of the starting endpoint. Um, and you just assume, as with you know, most, most of our fan tours, our walking tours, that you're going to be on the move and on the go for two, two and a half hours, however long the tour is. So just yeah, wear comfortable shoes, be dressed for the weather, um, all that. So thank you guys. Just want to give those two updates. So now we're going to turn it over to Madam President. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy, for reminding me to be on time. I walk in late, so sorry, getting out of work. Um, so uh, welcome everybody. It's great to see um, a small, exclusive, lovely group. Um, I'm always just happy to be with people in a natural, three-dimensional plane instead of just being on the screen. So it's really great to see everyone here. I only have a few, um, a few announcements. Um, first of all, I want to thank. It was a really nice day. It had a lot of really nice photographs without my feet to the family kind of speech. But it was really, it was really a lot of fun. And a great group of people at the Stony Hall was was lovely. It was a nice, nice day. So nice to be out of the celebration of the church. Thank you. And I got to meet Ellen. No, it's Ellen, sorry, but I knew I did. Ellen. I got to be. So it was fun with Carol. So that was that was cool. They were really they were really fun people. Um, <clears throat> really, nothing major to announce except for next week we've got the Global Guide Summit. Okay, so if you go to globalguidealliance.com, you can sign up. It's um, thirty dollars because you sign up with a uh, ten dollar discount for being a GANIC member. So just put GANIC into the sign up. Queue. It's only thirty dollars. And if you cannot go to this um, in live. So it's, it's a virtual event. So it's May 16th and 17th, that's the education day. May 18th, that is the um, lead the tour operator day. All right, so you can sign up. Um, so if you cannot see it live, you can watch the recording. So once you're registered and sign up, so again, go to globalguidealliance.com. That you get that $10 discount and then $5 goes to Gannett. $5 goes to Gannett. The other thing I'd like to announce, and this is posted in our Facebook group, the most posted in our Facebook group that you also received announcement about these, um, NYC Tourism Cares with NYC and Company. And this is going to be coming up in, I believe it's Morningside Park. Morningside Park. It's Tuesday, May 24th, 9.30 to 4. It's a $125 um, fee, but the $100 of that is tax deductible. Um, uh, and I was just thinking about this last night. I think Gannon should have a team. You can have a corporate team of like four people, and you're cleaning up the park. It's a day of cleaning and weeding and working together, sponsored by NYC and company. And that they're 
are, are big uh, loves. So, you know, I, I'd like to kind of do a mycelium company activity. So, look, you can look into that again. It's uh, posted in our Facebook group, Tourism Affairs with NYCM Company, Tuesday, May 24. So, actually, uh, a really nice event. It's good to go outside and get dirty. I know I like and be and do that kind of thing. So, it'll be an annoying side part. All right, that's really all I have to say, except to, I'm just so happy to see everybody's out and about every day and seeing pictures of guides working with groups, complaining about groups. It's nice to have, to <laughs> have, to have, to have, right? it's nice to have those, um, those funny stories that are coming back, the anecdotes, and those questions that we never thought we'd guess, and then somebody will ask that question. So anyways, it's great to see everyone out and about. I think you're all doing well and enjoying the gorgeous, gorgeous spring weather. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to introduce uh, Bob, who's going to introduce our speaker. So thank you. So uh, for the almost 40 of you who have the fortune of being on the 30s, Shuttle bus run through Roosevelt Island. You know she is a great guy and knows a great deal about this place. So Jimmy's been president of the Roosevelt Island Historical Society since 1999, coordinating <coughs> preservation efforts, exhibitions, and related activities on the island. She's been the project manager of the Roosevelt Island Historic Society Visitor Center Kiosk, which is housed in a historic trolley that was repurposed as a visitor center kiosk. Judy's been awarded numerous awards for her grassroots efforts. She's a local historian specialist. She's assisted in school teaching since 2014 at Columbia University, a historic preservation studio within the university's graduate school of architecture, planning, and preservation. Judy is a historical consultant a lecturer and a project lead, and she's lived on Roosevelt Island for over 40 years. So please welcome Judy Bird. Thank you. It's a pleasure to welcome you to the island. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you to this library that was announced the same time they announced Cornell Tech, which was about 15 years ago. Everything here takes a long time. You're the first group that I've been able to have in this room because the building opened last year. Uh, I've already, I know Beth because Beth did a program for us for the Historical Society a few months last year and it was most successful. Uh, Bob and uh, Beth and I met a few weeks ago at an undisclosed location. <laughs> and, sure. Um, and uh, I'm really glad you're here. You're in our community, in our library. It's uh, it's a little small town here, as you can see. I mean, you know, this is not midtown Manhattan. And uh, I really think you'll enjoy it. Uh, the first part of my tour is my, my personal tour is going to give you a little bit of the history. And then what we're going to do is do a tour. And we're going to start at the south end and walk north. Because if you were a group, with a group of people, you would start somewhere and go somewhere. So, uh, and of course, I left the maps in the chaos, but Gloria, you know, who's working there, is going to bring them. But in the meantime, you'll be able to follow along. So, <clears throat> this is a map of the island in the 1820s, and um, it shows a few of the buildings. Unfortunately, you can't use a pointer with these screens. Uh, and uh, it shows the lunatic asylum, which is up here at the north end. And the penitentiary, uh, yeah, the Penitent Asylum, the city uh, hospital, and uh, the charity hospital, which and then the school, another penitentiary, another building here, and a very, it's very imaginative because I cannot figure out what where everything is, but it looks good, you know, one of those graphics looks great. <laughs> so, um. This is a bit of this is a courier and knives that's very famous. It's been seen in many locations, and it shows it's probably from about 85th Street looking onto the island. And there's one little building there that was a lunatic asylum. When the lunatic asylum was designed, it did not have the dome. Those of you who took the bus tour saw the dome on the building, the 
back to that. Those are students. That's fine. And the penitentiary was at the south end, where you all went by Cornell Tech. And then the penitentiary was the first building structures there. They were there from the 1820s until 1936, when it was so bad and so corrupt that uh, Mayor Fiorello the party closed it and moved everyone to the luxurious New Rikers Island. Mm -hmm. And three years later, the Old Water Hospital opened at that site. And yes, the prisoners did go uh, in the zebra, they called them zebras in their uniforms marching around. Uh, it was a very bad penitentiary. It had a terrible reputation and very corrupt. Next door to it, which is now over here, was Charity Hospital, City Hospital, which was also the south end of the island. Uh, it opened in the 1830s. It had a fire and was rebuilt within three years. And this is how Chip City Hospital looked when it was about to be demolished. Unfortunately, it was not a rare park and was only on the National Register of Historic Sites. And our administration got away with demolishing it. Uh, if we want to discuss some things our administration said that. So that was and that goes across the island of the south, but the south point park is now. And when you go in the park, you see the columns that held up the beams of the city hospital. That's all we have left of that wonderful structure. The Alms House, which was the city home, which was the home for uh, indigent poor and elderly, it was right across the street next to the chapel. And it was a women's alms house and a men's alms house. And uh, they took care of everyone, same as uh, any institution would do. Not to say they were the greatest, but it was run by the city department of charities and corrections. And by the way, good combination. <laughs> and it was the last alternative, you know. We'll discuss the glorious history of New York. This is not the Gilded Age, <laughs> maybe for the people. Next door, and plus, the brilliance in the sun. That's how we originally went to the sign by Alexander Jackson Davis. And the sun is from 1826 to 1895. Two people who visited it one was Nellie Wise, and one was uh, Charles Dickens. We'll tell you about that in a second. Uh, after the city uh, asylum closed in 1895, the building became Metropolitan Hospital, which was a pretty good uh, the city hospital that uh, was a general hospital. And one thing they did was they treated a lot of tuberculosis patients on the asylum. And that was one of their specialties. As I was saying, Charles Dickens came here in 18. 42, he wrote in his book, American Notes. I don't know where they took me. I thought it was Rhode Island or Long Island. <laughs> <laughs> no, Charles, you're at Black Rose Island. And he wrote about the lounging, listless air and the madhouse feeling. He kind of strip And in 1887, a young lady named Nellie Bly, her real name was Elizabeth Cochran, uh, was trying to get a job as a journalist in New York. And she uh, offered me back to the office of Joseph Pulitzer in the New York world. And they said, well, you can go out there and see what you can find out about the bad things that have been happening at the women's asylum. So she checked into a rooming house and feigned insanity by talking in foreign tongues and pretending her name was Miss Brown and they lost her luggage coming from Mexico. And very confused. So after three days of that, they sent her off to go through. And I'm sure she had a thorough diagnosis. And they put her on a steamer and sent her off to Black Falls Island to the asylum. And uh, they kept her here for uh, a short while and they gave her a bath and throwing filthy dirty water on her. The women were made to sit in an on a bench straight for eight hours a day. And the food was horrendous, and the, the quote unquote nurses were really female inmates from the workhouse. And they would have tables of beautiful food, and they would not let them eat that. They were giving horrible food. So after 10 days, Joseph Fuller's lawyer got her out, and she then started to write an expose for 10 days in the madhouse. And being in those days of the competition of newspapers, uh, they serialized it. 
went on forever you know, because you could sell another 2,000 newspapers for a penny each. And uh, so she became famous for the expose. And of course, then a few years later, she went around the world in 73 days and do that at the next spot. So the house, the asylum was closed in 1895. The building was uh, switched to the Metropolitan Hospital, which had been a homeopathic hospital on Boys Island, and it became a general hospital. And Metropolitan Hospital was here until 1955. We had a fine reputation. I still meet people who were born there, or whose parents were born there, or some people who worked there. And uh, that hospital decided to, decided to relocate it <coughs> in, in uh, 1955. It moved to First Avenue and 97th Street. So Metropolitan Hospital started out on Boards Island, went to Black Rose, or uh, Roosevelt Island, and now ended up on Manhattan Island. So if you go up, you can see all three sides of the hospital. And uh, the building was abandoned for over 50 years. And luckily, around 1996, a developer came aboard with Bruce Becker. And his company just took on a challenge of restoring the building on the exterior, rebuilding the wings, which had been demolished, and making it into an apartment house, a rental apartment building. And uh, this is a picture of the nurses from the place of 1942 standing on the staircase and you can see the Christmas tree and every year the nurses would go uh, so Christmas caroling and uh, they would take a picture of the staircase. Uh, the building is on the National Register of Historic Sites. It's a New York City landmark and it is LEED certified. So uh, the good thing if you're nice to the developer they give you an office in perpetuity in the building. So very nice to develop and you have a beautiful office on the fourth floor of the building. One other structure that changed the island a lot was the Queensboro Bridge. Uh, the first picture is the Queensboro Bridge. It's a little building you can see here uh, very clearly. That was the warden's house. The penitentiary was next door to the uh, next door to the bridge, and the warden somehow had this beautiful Victorian house with an in-crowd store. And uh, <laughs> I know I have, I have this aerial picture, not even, even at a diamond. Uh, and the picture, the next picture is the penitentiary, uh, uh, where now Cornell is and we're going for the hospital. Is. So I always say this island has had layers of history. This everything has been something else before. Uh, it makes it more interesting. One thing that completely changed us was the Queensboro Bridge, which opened in 1909. Uh, it not only changed uh, us, but it changed the borough of Queens. We also not only, we also developed uh, a trolley, the trolley that stopped and you could get off the trolley to take it elevated down onto the island. So it made the island more usable, shall we say. And uh, the trolley system which are kiosks with the entrance to operated from 1960, 1967 to 1957. We would go to a trolley station at the foot of the Queensboro Bridge, go downstairs, get on the trolley. And some trolleys went to Astoria, some went to uh, out to Calvary Cemetery, some went to Jamaica, they five different lines and they all went to different areas of Queens. And the one, just one went over the Queensboro Bridge. And they stopped in the middle of the bridge, got on the elevator, came down to the island. Any other questions? No, maybe we can the trams. You can't build over the tram cables. <laughs> yes, we always have neighbors that say, let's put it in the, let's put it in the elevator bridge or staircase. It's, 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 like, it's like 250 feet up to the foot to the bridge. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the contemporary map of the island, which we knew about and not with us, so you'll have your own copy to cherish for the rest of your life. <laughs> Trust me, you know, you're all in tourism. 
no one can tell city maps anymore. Mm -hmm. NYC and company has said, and I can't get here. Well, I have two of us who come in. I can't get to the map. I mean, it's terrible. I'm not white maps. So. No, so all of you, please get the steps. That's my propaganda for the morning. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to start at the very southern tip of the island down here at the FDR Fort Williams Park. And that was designed by Louis Kahn. Uh, in, and it was designed in the 1970s, 1973. It was never built. Louis Kahn had the nerve to drop dead in the National Defense Station in 1974. And it was announced when they had the opening of Rose Park Island that the uh, FDR for the Park would be built here. Well, no one ever raised the money. And until around 2007 uh, or eight, the person running the island just said, Give us back the bank, we'll build the park for you. So the final it was built at the cost of $52 million in uh, November 2012. Uh, in 1973, when the park was discussed in the island, our name was officially changed from Welfare Island to Franklin County, Coast of Island. That's a copy of the FDR speech, his four freedom speech, which was done on January 6th, I think 1941. And uh, the bust of Ken was a complicit company, the artist. It's a reproduction of a very small bust. And then uh, is in the park. David, he's facing north, and uh, I don't know, we did want to look out of the river. At least. <coughs> and this is some of the views of, in the park. The park is absolutely beautiful. It's uh, it's open every day except Tuesday. Do you want to send it on here on Tuesday? I think this week's section is also closed on Tuesday. We don't want anyone to complain <laughs> that the park's closed, so we don't open it either. And the, uh, this is the kind of staircase and the walls uh, where uh, the staircase is decorated now for many occasions for gay pride for the month of June. We have the pride flag. We also have poppy seeds and uh, poppy flowers in November for the 100th anniversary of the Burgers World War. We had uh, sunflowers. And it's really fun because you go in the park and you have this the staircase. One accommodation was made because being the FDO for a freedom park, it was not the same as accessible. Oops. So we now have a wheelchair, a very discreet lift over on the head. So people who uh, are need to use the lift can go up uh, on the over the staircase. And those are 100 little leaf linden trees. Which are now very big little leaf linden trees. You know, it's been uh, about 10 years and uh, they are flourishing and the park is doing very well. Unfortunately, it's not taken, it's not owned by the, administered by the FDR Forum Freedoms Foundation anymore because it was just financially uh, too challenging. So it's run by New York State Parks. So uh, they have to, unfortunately, move go by some of the state parks rules, which are not as liberal as. Uh, easy going as when it's uh, the private foundation, but the park's lovely, the staff is great, and how it acts, so who runs the president is great, and they're very community oriented. Uh, they, they do a lot of those things. Last weekend, they had an Adirondack chair bill, so if you go in there, you can see all kinds of Adirondack chairs this stuff. Yeah. Where's the Meredith Burnett? Yeah. Oh, yeah, she's she, here, she is coming up. Oh, she's very. <laughs> Okay, so one problem we had was a lot of the people who, who lived on the island were at the former Goldwell Hospital site, and they were a little upset that the FDR Park did not reflect a community of people with disabilities. So that's good. So Karen um, Bergman was a patient, and she does we have this picture of uh, the sculpture. It's FDR with a little girl. And he's in a wheelchair and she has a brace on her leg. And <clears throat> that was commissioned. Uh, and it's in, on the way down to the FDR Memorial along the West Roadway there. You know? And uh, that is it's a very nice area because all these little white lines are F, one, one says FDR is history and the other says the island history. And it came out very nice. And as I said before, 
the pillars on the first picture are the supports from the uh, city hospital, which is, of course, no, is no longer there. Two other places in the park. One is Strecker Memorial Laboratory. Strecker was a medical pathology research laboratory, and it has been, it was closed for many years and abandoned. It is now part of the New York Transit Authority. It's a power conversion station. There's subways run on DC, and we get AC, so they do magic in there. And as we said, they said, TA said they needed a conversion station. Their choice was Sutton Place or Roosevelt Island. <laughs> and this is on the East Promenade. Uh, this is a new walkway. There's one on the west side. And this one is on the east side, and so when you go down, you can walk on this. I don't suggest you take seven or eight year old little boys who want to walk on the rocks. We, we think it's bad at houses because it's whoops, in the river. The other side, uh, the west side, we have very nice benches and uh, we, those wonderful lounge chairs looking out of the hat. This is the east side, and it looks out on the Queens and for the New Queens, which is broken by leaps and bounds. So uh, the park is now complete. Uh, we, you won't fall off from other things, just for construction. This was Goldwater. Goldwater was uh, where Cornell Tech is. Goldwater opened in 1939. It was a long-term care and rehabilitation hospital designed uh, by Isidore Rosenfield, who designed a lot of municipal hospitals in the 1930s and 40s. Very progressive, all out, all south facing rooms, lots of light, lots of air, lots of rooms and terraces so that the residents could be outside at the moment because it was not even in the 1930s. So it's a very, uh, it was a very good building. It was not even out of the building except Mike Bloomberg wanted a tech center and it was his land. So the hospital was relocated. And uh, the hospital opened. 39 and closed in November of 2013. And uh, some things that were in there was one of the uh, was one of the murals. There were four uh, WPM murals. This one was done by Ilya Bolotowski, abstraction. There's another one done by Albert Swindon, uh, Paul Rubolo, and uh, Dave Chimes. One of three of them have been found. These were under seven coats of paint in the hospital day rooms. This one was restored in 2001, and when they were closing the hospital, part of the contract with Cornell was to take the murals and restore them. And they lived there on burlap, more or less, the campus. They literally peeled them off the wall, and it's amazing to see. I have photographs. And uh, they peeled them off and took them to conservation lands. You didn't know it was lead paint and plaster and asbestos. So it was a very long procedure to restore them, but they are beautiful. And two of them are on display in Cornell. <clears throat> and the third one, uh, which is all maritime scenes, will go somewhere at Cornell. This is Cornell's logo. It's also Porter at Cornell Tech and the Jacobs Technion Institute from Haifa, Israel. They are the partners, and a lot of the professors come from Israel to teach there. This is one of the original renderings, and it did come out looking like this, uh, of the different buildings. This is the academic building, the Bloomberg Center. This is Weissman Freddy's uh, co-working co space, which I think Cornell was finally bought because it just didn't succeed as a co-working space, and they'll use it for other things. This is the apartment house called the house. There are no dorms because this is all graduate students. And this is the hotel. And these are the, at the moment that the campus is only a third of the site. So there's plenty of land to grow on. And uh, I mean, you know, we were all a little shocked at it, but it came out okay. And we find it's very comfortable to go down there. The cafe is so open, great bathrooms. Um, <laughs> you're in the tourism business, you can't. Yeah. Like <laughs> And uh, I asked the dean, do you mind? He said no. I asked the restaurant manager, he said yes, he minds. <laughs> but uh, this is the uh, what is it, the Tata building, and this is the, um, the Swindon uh, mural that's on the wall. Uh, 
Unfortunately, Cornell is not open to visitors. Yeah. I mean, it's ridiculous at this point. We know every no, 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 you have to go get a pass. You have to have someone you know, bring you in. And it is frustrating because, you know, uh, but it's like most universities. I hear you can't get in with my you. Are they going to get a uh, uh, They were giving three tours of the artwork. I have no idea. But I figured some of it. Frack University is still not a thing. Which one? Frack and Brooklyn. Right, I know. Which is yeah. full of art. So. Well, well, I can understand Frack, but trust me, the Cornell building is white. <laughs> the Cornell building's material is white. Mm -hmm. There's nothing, there's not one piece of art aside from a few art pieces. So, this is the Graduate Hotel, which is much more fun. His name is Fly Boy, and he was not an artist, his name is Hebrew. From Chicago and Fly Boy seeks to be the mascot there. He hasn't moved in a year. And the whole theme of the Graduate Hotel is textbooks. The entire decor of the lobby is textbooks. And now Cornell Tech does not use any textbooks, but <laughs> we, they had box books, flats, and cartons of textbooks they bought. So if you want to go back to study philosophy, accounting, <laughs> Of stand shirts into the you can just stand there and go, okay. <laughs> and uh, the hotel opened last year, it's owned by this graduate company, and their theme is always college towns. They're in New Haven, they're in, well, I think, Lansing, they're in Annapolis, and they always use themes that are sort of related to the college. I know the one in um, Eugene, Oregon, is Nike sneakers. I wonder why. That's where they came from. But the top of the graduate hotel is the Panorama Room, which is a bar and life refreshments. And it's on the 22nd floor, I think. And it looks right next to the Queensboro Bridge. It has phenomenal views. And weather permitting, they open up as a big terrace. And it's very popular with pictures on Saturday night. <laughs> we have more fun staying with visitors that you're watching them go to the Panorama Room. Because you might have to wear turquoise mylar pants to get in. I just like to see the hipsters going in. Can I just point out this Hebrew piece? It's, uh, he has a number of right. series of these, and there's one that's now standing at uh, the uh, at Battery Park, and they're based upon and inspired by Tuskegee Airmen. And so, oh, and he's yeah, I've seen his cartoons in that. Yeah. In fact, if you want to, on his website, they have, uh, you can watch them build Flyboy. Flyboy went in before the windows went in. And it's, and the hotel looks like a Yes, the restaurant. Yeah, the rest, there's a restaurant downstairs and this uh, bar upstairs, which is only open. I'm not sure if it's open Monday, Tuesday. I know it's not open Monday. It, it, it's either open Wednesday or Sunday. They serve. We get brunch. Uh, all I know is my brother and sister in law are staying here next to me. I always do that. Yeah. <laughs> They're very nice people. <laughs> Anyhow, okay, this is our famous cherry tree. This is one of our multitude of cherry trees with a tram in the background. The original cherry trees were Poisson cherry trees donated by. Alice uh, Fordyce and Mary Lasker. Anyone does tours? Where else did you feel Lasker name or Lasker names? On your tour guides, you know this. So these are two of our trees. We have over 100, uh, 400 trees on the other than flower. Uh, and these are croissants. They are the last ones to bloom. So don't send anyone to see them before April 20th because they're not going to be in bloom and they come in a kiosk. Why did the tree? Yesterday, the guy was arguing with me why was it the tree of doom? <laughs> you know, this is it. You get this on your buses and your tour too. And the little sculpture at the bottom is called the Purple Dragon, designed by, designed by a Swedish uh, sculptor, uh, Gustav Kreitz, and it's at the south end of the promenade here. And uh, he, he's a little dragon looking at it if he went. This is my favorite picture of the tram. <laughs> so now you still have the south end. 
and this is the best building on the island, the visitor center, my baby. And the rock next to it, there are two rocks. You have to have to them. And one of them says T, and the other one says birds. And these rocks were on the waterfront in the south end amongst the rubble of debris, professionally engraved T birds. We don't know who T birds was, but you're all invited to make up your own stories. And there's also a name on the little stone in front of it. So last year we told uh, three out of the people that were on the island that we wanted it. Oh, you can't, you know, but we were afraid that maybe T birds' descendants will be insulted. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and that's our own class on cherry tree. Then. So, everyone, your role of action is to invite everyone in to visit your own T Birds story. This is our new tram. Our tram opened, the original tram opened May 17, 1976. And uh, it was in service until 2009. Uh, by then it was 34 years old or so, and it was, it was getting old. And uh, so this tram was uh, contracted and built by the French. In nine months flat, they tore down the old tram. They did not turn, turn down the towers, but they had to change the entire thing. And this is a independent operating system. So one cabin could travel and the other one could stay in the station and you could repair, renovate, fix things. So you're not, it's never out of service completely. And the only time a tram doesn't run is when you have uh, thunder and lightning and wind over 50 miles an hour. And if it's open 6 a.m. to 2 a.m. weekdays and 6 a.m. to 3 a.m. weekend. And it's a metro board. And we do not say no. This is a surprise. About 2011, the Ireland uh, announced that there's this mental later sham opposite our subway station, and they were going to put a brick wall up because this building is protecting the ventilation system for the subway and also the new Grand Central Link Long Island Railroad under it. We have four tracks there with two for the subway and two for the railroad underneath. And we said, Oh, we want another brick wall. So God bless Sandra Bloodworth and Arts for Transit. This beautiful wall, which is an abstraction, has been installed, and that's the artist, <coughs> uh, Diana Cooper. So this is another project that was done in 2011. The wall was just installed a few weeks ago, but technically the construction is still not finished, so they had to cover it up with wood. So someday you have to bring a blue here go, here's the wall. And uh, just be patient. So uh, I'm very proud of it. I'm very happy that we got it. And uh, just remember, everything takes a living. <laughs> this is our New York City ferry stop. We got the ferry about five years ago, six years ago. We go from 90th Street, Carshares Park, to the Astoria, to Roosevelt Island, to the Pepsi sign, Queens, to 34th Street, to the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and to Wall Street. The route gets longer every time, but it's very, <laughs> very popular. It's probably the financial route down there. It's very popular. Yeah, yeah. And it's like over ten dollars a ride it costs. You know, we like the ferry <coughs> and it's darn cold on that pier in the winter. So very few people, besides the people who can be a ride. If you look out the window when you get up, that's Blackwell House. This is a, a view of the, sun, the original front of the house. When the Blackwell family owned the house, it faced Queens. And that's the front of the house faced Queens. The back of the house is from the street, which from the back of the house. And as we have a new ADA ramp, the house was repaired and restored and reopened two years ago. And this building that we're in, and the house is open Wednesday to Sunday, 11 to 5. And Andrew, who works there, is absolutely great. It's a great supervisor. And this is our library, which was originally one of our five public schools. And it did, uh, the public schools were moved to a large building about 15 years ago when this building was closed. So, this, uh, when the library ran out of space in its old site, they rented this space 
and above us is the Catholic Church because the Catholic Church did not want to deal with the government authority that ran the island, so they went to their own spaces and we moved upstairs. So they have a lovely church upstairs and they have a wonderful library downstairs. This is the inside of Blackwell House. It's furnished in uh, reproduction original and it's nice and very comfortable. It's not very big and it's not big enough that it needs very much things, but at least it gives you a flavor of uh, the house. This is the original one of the original apartment houses right out the window, River Cross. And uh, when I moved here, that Sculpture was here with intervals and it's all gone. And this was the co op building built by uh, New York State Urban Development Corporation and financed by HUD. This is a 360 unit uh, co op. And, uh, it's a very nice building and it's one of the four attractive buildings on the island. I mean, I do not know what the orange tubes are, but we have orange tube blue tubes. Yellow tubes for the different weights of the building. So there's a picture of blue tube. Our church also, when they restored our church, they decided that they would put the air conditioning system in the steeple so the church bell was on the <laughs> <laughs> Okay. And then we have some other interesting street furniture. This is the front of the library, and this is our very nice red waste baskets. Which I love. I just wish they would be paid. But uh, I think they're rather gross on my own men. He loved the color of it. This is Chapel of the Good Shepherd, designed by Frederick Clark Withers. It opened in 1889, and it was uh, being made live by the Protestant Episcopal Mission Society. It is now a community center because the state of New York is not allowed to open, open a church. So this kind of church, and uh, it's still used by a few uh, Protestant parishes when the Catholics have moved down. And we have a separate synagogue and separate uh, mosque. So, um, but it's a lovely building. It's a landmark. It's on the National Register, and it has it's pretty well taken care of. It has a wonderful slate roof. It's uh, very well worshipped. This is our school right up the street, PSIS 217. It opened in the 1990s and it took, replaced the uh, five small school buildings. Everyone okay? It's fresh. <laughs> okay, this is Motor Gay. This is our parking garage. Anybody ever familiar with Boston? You know, the city hall of Boston had that four heads. It's the same problem. It's not it leaks. It leaks. And it's, and it's drafty. It's cold. It's they have to pay they have to pay as a dollar to repair it. They put all the lighting fixtures on between the slabs of concrete. So it guarantees a leak. Uh, I mean, they have spent more money repairing this building. And it's still a condo or whatever the company is. It's, it's a disaster. But the ski slope is nice. <laughs> Across the street is Manhattan Park. That was the second phase of houses built in um, 18, 1989. And I love this swimming pool or outdoor pool. It's a membership pool, and every year they hire an artist to paint the deck. So the deck looks good for a few months, and but it's, it's, it's colorful. And it's right on the water. The deep end is only four and a half feet, so we won't go out. This is the Octagon, the Octagon building, the former asylum, with its two modern wings. And across the street from Octagon, we have our public tennis courts. <coughs> and we have Octagon Park, which has picnic benches and uh, of the soccer field and of the baseball field, also at the Octagon. Coming to the north end of the island at the end of your trip is my favorite thing, the lighthouse. It was just restored by Arkansas Cloud Fenneman. It had this ugly squat uh, top on it that we don't know where it came from because the original top was like uh, had a point and the walk around. 
and the Lighthouse Park just reopened, and the girl puzzle is an art piece of Nellie Bly and four other women, and that opened last December. It's called the Girl Puzzle. It has a lot of publicity, and it's been getting a lot of visitors. And not only do they have the uh, large seven foot tall models, but next to each one is a, a small model that a boy person or a person is visually handicapped could feel and braille and with all the QR codes. So to find that, that more about it. And that's called the Girl Puzzle. That's the one with color out. Is that permanent? It better be. <laughs> <laughs> is there a is there a monitor here? Uh, so this is our map. Everyone can and uh, no, it's so funny because the far it's all a donation and they put it down like it has a plate. You just spent ten thousand dollars to come to New York and you don't have to get your dog. <laughs> it's the same thing. <laughs>
and it's a noise that we had a piazza and there's lots of barbecue people want a barbecue lighthouse park and architect park has grills they must try to put in a few grills here and suddenly we had 50 kibachis that was the end of the <laughs> It's very hard because anything you can close right into people's yeah. Yeah. So I leave you. Uh, get off the bus, watch your step. The lady knows to the right. And uh, any questions? Uh, yeah, on the south end, uh, that's probably one of the prime places to watch fireworks, right? Yes. And do they do they host people? At, uh, at I have a messed up system every year, no matter what they do. Uh, I don't know. You just go and stand on the hill at the, by Cornell and you can watch the fireworks. They used to let a certain number of people into the FDR park, but it's very small and it doesn't really work. So most people just come and at the last minute, they like to go up on the hill and that's what people do. Plus, it's really good because when you're on the hill, you can get out. The hitch with the fireworks, not getting here, it's getting home afterwards. <laughs> We once had a cherry blossom festival, there were 25,000 people. <laughs> that was the end of the cherry <laughs> It was unbelievable. I'm standing and the boards come pouring out, and we don't have bathrooms, we don't have restaurants, we don't have anything that we can accommodate that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I know. The library had a line for them one day after. So that's, we, we have planned very well. So our administration, unless they fired three of the four people in our communications team. So I don't know what's happening. So anyhow, any other questions? I hope you all come back. I hope you bring your visitors. I love to be professional that I keep them. unfortunately I see the comment. And uh, and uh, it's lots of fun to have people in the Yes, you can tell that the people when, when they come to the island that we have excellent pizza. And, and they have excellent pizza. And, and uh, at the supermarket, they can get something to eat. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and have we have, we send everyone to the Cornell or to the pizza or to the Japanese. Why not to eat that much? Well, Cornell is very limited menu, but they do have a convenient bed for us. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The market has that. But uh, it's, it's fun. I mean, I welcome everyone. If I have cards, if anyone wants to get in touch with us, we love to host your groups. And we love to be tutors. And I thank you very much. There's a great store at the gallery. That uh, yes. I suggest to check it out. We're going to be there at the afternoon. Gallery is just across the street from the oh. main gallery. Oh. Yes. Just one of the very small tidbit. Everyone here knows and loves Jared Goldstein. Yes. Uh, and some of you may remember that Jared proposed to his wife. Oh, oh, we, have had, we have had a lot of proposals. I don't know what the proposition is. And for some reason, we get groups of very religious people supporting Jews. They come and they, they, they're throwing flower petals around and then they're coming in offering us candy. And they have the time the bride and don't know where the heck they are, but they do that. And yeah, we've had all kinds of things on the trail. I do have one couple who comes every year for their anniversary. Uh, they came in when they got married, and uh, they come back every year on their anniversary. Oh, so. They have to lose the yeah, <laughs> Excuse me, but that's not correct. <laughs> that's great. Thank you. Thank you so much for your So, um, that was great. I mean, I, I, love, and I love this kind of map. The things you were thinking about maps, I had a guess I worked with one little observatory. Mm -hmm. She said, Do you have any maps? I said, No. She said, But I want a map. She, said, she was looking for a map. She said, Why don't you think about maps anymore? I want a map. I want a map. But I said, Write down that the next box is on. I know. I like that. I like when you fold it up, you don't want Wi Fi. You look at no, that. Those ones are great. Anyone has any contact with NYC? 
You could scream at them on audio. Yeah. Well, actually, yesterday at the city guide, I don't know if that was at city guide now. So, city guide has a nice map. Anyway, so I know exactly what you think about the map. So, thank you very much. That's wonderful. All right, so we're going to move on to our committee reports. So, the education committee, um, Nina is not here to read her report. I recall getting an email very last minute. So, let me let me pull that up. And then, um, so I'll go right to uh, government relations. Uh, so I'm going to All right, hi everybody. Guess what I'm going to talk about? Yes. Hey, there we go. Okay, Justin Brennan has not reintroduced him. So if you have not yet written Mr. Brennan, write him, email Justin Brennan. Has been designated by Adrian Adams, Speaker of the City Council, as the guy who needs to reintroduce 289A, which will give it a new number, which will allow the Government Relations Committee and you, of course, to start pressuring our City Council representatives to pass the bill to put you guys back on the double deck buses. In awareness that is New York City Council, uh, Brandon sits on the Committee for Finance, not the Department of Consumer and Worker Protections. Go figure. But write in if you haven't already. Write in if you have already. Say, hey, I wrote you. Tell me what's going on. And if you do get a response, please let government relations at gamut.org know so we know how we can follow up on a press for an in person meeting or a virtual meeting. So he's right. He hasn't done anything yet. We know he's back in the swing of things. Well, one slight correction, we do know that he has done one thing. He has co-sponsored uh, a bill 0079, <laughs> and this came yeah, 0079, really. Uh, this was a bill initiated by one of his favorite city council members, Dan Brewer, uh, that's going to limit the number of double-decker plates that will be issued. I want to knock it down to... Uh, 225. I don't know how many buses are rolling out there, but they want to limit the number. Now, we only started to discuss this on government relations. We would love your input again. Email government relations at canic.org. We do have to be a little careful on this if we if we take a position and the position we take, because two or only three sponsors of this bill, Dale Brewer, Councilman Yarek, and Councilman Brennan. Who we need right now. So we're going to slowly develop a, a working plan on that, but we certainly always want to work in. So again, government relations again, uh, well, let's not just think about this. Um, big event is on our calendar tomorrow. If you have a chance, have had a chance to read the Adams administration's rebuild, renew, and reinvent. This is the Adams uh, administration's plan for figurating the US economy post COVID. On page 24, list the number of licenses that are issued by consumer protection that are considered strenuous, onerous, too cumbersome. Somehow we're on that list. So we thank former GANIC member, the guy, uh, Moses Gates, friend of the family who uh, gave us a heads up on that. And Jonathan Tour of membership and myself will be in a Zoom session okay. tomorrow morning with the chief of staff of the deputy mayor responsible for economic development. We'll of course be making a pitch to maintain our license. And we've also been in invitation to have this meeting given the opportunity to make suggestions about what we as guys see on the streets that can be changed, improved, adapted uh, to improve the visitor experience. Because there is finally a recognition that tourism is a vital part of the New York City economy. They know they're going to lose the money. Because New York real estate value commercially is tanking. They're going to lose on the tax revenue. So tourism is now front and center. So as a community, what can we come up with that 
can make the tourist experience better. Yeah. Places to sit down and bathrooms. Yeah. <laughs> Already on my agenda. <laughs> now I know this is short notes, but meetings tomorrow morning, if you want to bang out an email, a quick note, that'd be great. We do have a, a list already of public restrooms, reading to you for some uh, uh, open spaces. Bringing back something similar to the unpass, that'd be great for our travelers yeah. and encourage them to take the subway to pull out street traffic. I might even wonder if there's anything we could do with 079 if they want to limit tour buses. Hey, how about making them uh, more environmentally friendly? You know, a couple of these things that have already gone on the list. We would like to hear from you again. I apologize for the short notice, but you have an opportunity to share us an email again at governmentrelations at gap.org. And that's really it, other than wish Jonathan and myself good luck tomorrow morning. Good luck. Thank you. Well, I'm glad we had the opportunity to respond to this. And if I have any, any questions or anybody else wants to now throw out any quick suggestions, I'll take it off a minute. Or language. Good, good, good. No, more, uh, more signage, signage language. more languages. Great. 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 You know, we are an international destination. Oh, yes, that's already on the list. I want one in every borough. Yeah, yeah, something. Now, by the way, you are getting one in Times Square. Uh, they did the unveiling um, last week. Of course, it's not built yet. <laughs> and we turned out a restroom. State, State Council did uh, pass an initiative requiring every uh, city, every district in the city, council district in the city, to identify where public restrooms can be adapted, constructed, to make available. They just don't pick it. Just pick locations. They're not even talking about building this stuff. And when I was in Red Hook, and they finally got it together to plan for a restroom in Valentino Park, lovely park right there in the world. Statue of Liberty. The city came to us with a oh, let's be two years away and it will cost you one million dollars. That's cheap. <laughs> really, there are so many European options that they could um, that would have produced a restroom in a very popular part in an isolated neighborhood, but chose not to do it. So this whatever city council thinks it's going to do, it's years away and it's going to be below. So while we have all the initiative. I'm not trusting the city. Um, anyone else? Any other suggestions? I'm here talking. You can yell at City Hall. Okay. Thanks, right. everybody. Thank you. Nice friend. All right. So I have one
Queens Castle detention of fair history of a forgotten prison. Um, if you look at the, the minutes, um, you know, all the reports are attached to the minutes. You can see a list of all the past um, fam tours from, from April and into May. And um, so it's really, um, you know, thanks always to everybody who does the fan tours. I want to thank you on behalf of Nina, but on behalf of all the members of Gannick. And if you haven't done a fan tour and you want to practice a tour, do it. It's <coughs> Really, it's probably going to be the most nervous you'll ever be to give a tour because you've got all your wonderful peers who know a whole ton of stuff and you're sitting there writing and thinking, oh my God. <laughs> but you will get all the feedback you didn't know you wanted to get. So <laughs> do a fan tour. It's really totally worth it. If you want to propose a tour, you go onto the Gannett website and there's a form you fill out. Don't just email it to you say, hey, I want to do a fan tour. There's a form on the Gannett website under the announcements and documents find it and you just fill it out and you just you know, send it in and then you give them some dates and it's usually approved. It's no problem whatsoever. Okay. So anyone has questions for education? Email them. <laughs> what is it? All right. It's the education meeting is actually I'm sorry on uh Wednesday the 18th. Wednesday the 18th. Right. So Wednesday the 18th um at six. Okay. All right so industry relations. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Beth Dock. For those of you who don't know me, this is my first uh, presentation for you all for industry relations. Uh, so I'm the co chair of the committee along with Bob Gilbert, who's, who's the man, <laughs> <laughs> and Harvey Davidson, who is also the man, but it's not a chairman of um, But he's super involved in that thing. So, um, uh, so the committee actually, thanks to committee con that we had several weeks back, thanks to Kevin and education uh, committee, uh, we added uh, several people to our committee, to the industry relations committee. So we had a meeting on April 21st to kind of introduce ourselves and go over what the committee does and a um, small group. So we had Harvey, Bob, myself, uh, Gwen Strong, uh, I need work, and Stephanie Simon. Uh, so thanks for attending uh, you all. And uh, we're gonna have another meeting at some point soon. We don't have a date yet, but um, you know, we'll kind of talk about more things that we've been discussing and get more participation. So um, <clears throat> one of the things that we did talk about at the, um, and our meeting was uh, Gannon's involvement in industry events. So, uh, so, so two likely big events that are coming up are CITA, which is the Student Food Travel Association that's in Washington, D.C. in August, and then IAPDP, uh, which is later in the year, and I don't remember November, 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 thank you. So our representatives right now are to be determined. Um, Harvey tends to go to these things, but um, we can certainly use somebody else to be happy to choose and represent Janet and, um, you know, kind of spread the word about us. So, uh, oh, this was this was great too. We met with uh, a few of us, Harvey and a few partners, so Bob and I met with um, some of the people in the education uh, committee to discuss uh, working together, like really closely in terms of finding locations for meetings day, and um, speakers. So, and, and what we're going to do, uh, we will announce, um, Kevin will announce uh, a, a, a meeting for the entire group of us, of all of us members, to get ideas about where they have our meetings who to bring in to uh, speak to us and associated with some sort of a theme of the month, the time of year, something like that. So it's a more of a unified type of setting. So um, that will, that, that's to be determined, but that's gonna happen. I and mean, we want everybody to be input on this. So right now, upcoming meeting locations are, June is at the LGBTQ Center Gay Center, uh, which is, uh, the speaker that uh, you run. Thank you, you Ryan. <laughs> um, so that's going to be really great. I'm not going to be there. I'm sorry. Um, but July, we've got the Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen. Uh, August, we're going to be in Linden Park. Uh, September is our EGM, and that's at the Sullivan. Uh, right? Nice. Emma. 
And October is at the Museum of Unusual Things, which should be really cool. And November is this is this is kind of cool. We're going to be at 1014 Fifth Avenue, which is uh, a beautiful um, Beaux Arts mansion that is now owned by a German organization. It's sort of a, it's just a very interesting place to be. That'll be fun. Uh, I'm hoping it's not going to be too late. <laughs> But anyway, <laughs> but it's going to be really great because it's just like, <laughs> it's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. But yeah, it's the last, um, well, one of the last of three standing, not three standing, but mansions, both our mansions, it's right across the street from uh, that particular uh, So, oh, and then finally, this is, this is great too. Uh, we're working on a site visit to the summit for our membership. So it will be several dates and, um, Probably later this month into June, and uh, we'll you know we'll get the word out when it's all finalized. But that's going to be really fun. That would be it for us. Can I just clarify what uh, what the intention uh, that she that Beth was mentioning? Just uh, well, I mean, she said it was very. Clearly, but I just want to encourage everyone if you have contact with either people who are in at venues that we can use and or who you think would be really compelling speakers, uh, this is going to be a joint meeting where we can sort of strategize what are practical places that will fit within our budgets. You know, don't need too high. You know, it would be great if we could, you know, well, okay, maybe we can go back to the Met at some time, but, uh, but we're not going to go to the Metropolitan Opera. Right, so that would be great, but but it's good. Yeah, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but um, <laughs> the idea is that we want we think that a lot of you out there have contacts and we just don't know them, so we want this to be as open as possible. So please just start thinking about this. And as that said, you'll get an invitation where we're going to meet as a group and it's going to have a very strict agenda. We're only talking about identifying and throwing up and brainstorming about venues and speakers and how they can be connected with one another. So please do join us if you if you have ideas about that. Thank you. Uh, so I just wanted to say that Emma gave a fantastic speech at the Women in Tourism event, uh, talking about how tour guides are the foot soldiers of the hospitality industry, that we are often uh, the, the New Yorkers that guests have the most interaction with. Uh, and did a really great job representing who we are as guides and who we are as camping. So that was really fantastic. It was very inspiring. Uh, it was quite an afternoon. Um, I want to welcome some new members. Uh, this is going to be our March and April members Jennifer Andres, Patrick Bringley, who's already doing fan tours. Good for him. Tyler Goldberg, uh, Virginie Olive. Brittany Joyce, Melinda Montalvo, Mark Satloff, and Alvaro Uchelet. Uh, so we want to welcome all of those new provisional members. Uh, we are always looking for new members, so please let them know we are a growing organization and have been all the way through COVID. Um, I am excited to say this or may not be the last time that I am giving the membership uh, committee report. Uh, thanks to uh, CommitteeCon, which Kevin organized, we may have identified a potential new chair for the committee, which I am extraordinarily excited about. Uh, TVD, though, that is going to be an exciting reveal, perhaps for next month. We shall see. Um, I do have a little bit of tedious business to take care of, and that is. We all sort of rushed in here after what sounds to be like a fantastic fam tour, and I didn't get to take attendance. So I'm just feeling sort of particular. I'm just going to run through this. If you hear your name, please raise your hand. And if I haven't mentioned your name, please let me know. Uh, Alexander Aguirre, fantastic. I thought that was you. I apologize. I don't know everybody, and I'm trying to learn. Uh, Evelyn Andre. Oh, fantastic. Okay, great. I kind of had a feeling. Uh, Fumi Arai, I got George Baedeker, wonderful, excellent. I'm trying to memorize people's faces with masks. That's the hard thing, is the face plus mask. Matt Baker we have, 
Howard Birnbaum we have, Susan Birnbaum we have, Deb Blau we had, she's gone for a walk, uh, Pat Brown Mazuka, yes, Karen Brooker, yes, oh, okay, fantastic. Now you do look familiar, you've been with that mask. Patrick Casey, yes, Amy Cook, yes, Rita DeCassia, yes, Tony DeSanti, yes, I thought I saw you, David Dunlop, I saw him, he was here, Dave Gardner, of course, Robin Gar, Bob Gilbert, Beth Goff, Bill Goodhart, uh, our president, and I guess consultants. Adam Guy. Adam Guy? No, okay. Uh, William Kahn. Oh, fantastic. Okay, I'm starting to recognize you. I apologize. Stanley Culp, I got you. Uh, Mark Landman, Kevin Lawrence, Ann McDermott, not here. Nina Mende, not here. Charlie Meissner, I saw you. Mitch Pelusic, I saw you. Brendan Rothman Hicks. Didn't think so. Minna Sharp, I got you. Uh, John I'm like, no. Kristen Singleton Ferrari, I saw you. Me, I'm here. Uh, ben Wagenberg, fantastic. Okay. See, Jeremy, if I didn't mention your name, please raise your hand. I think I've got all the other people. Fantastic. Well, I got you. Yeah, but just a question. Is anybody in your list of new people here tonight? No. Unfortunately, not. I was going to have to stand up. But some of you may be out there. If you're out there watching, just wave to us. <laughs> Glad to have you here. Okay, that's my report. Thank you very much. Okay. Right. Um, Thank you. 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 Just another question for Judy. Uh, does the Japanese place have ramen? Yes, I had a motion to adjourn the meeting. Second. Okay. All in favor?